praise the Lord. Um, you know, God is doing so much um, in each one of our lives. Um, and however good or bad it may feel, I know that, uh, you know, He's going to take us across the line. And, uh, and we, are, we are changing. You know, there's a transformation that's taking place in us. And uh, when we're not alone, just we encourage you. You're not alone. Uh, this morning, okay, let's come around the Lord the Lord. And uh, I just this morning felt um, to share around what it means to have the, uh, um, the eyes of our hearts opened. You know, I think it's so important that we do have the eyes of our hearts opened to the Lord in order to hear, you know, what God is saying to us, in order to see what God is uh, wanting to reveal to us. And, um, you know, I've, I've learned what it means to, you know, take our eyes off the problems and to keep our eyes focused on the Lord. The Word of God says that, um, that we can rejoice at all times, in good times and in bad times. And so I, I, I ask you, how is it, how are we able to rejoice in the Lord at all times, in the good times and in the bad times? Unless our eyes are fixed on the Lord and not on the problems or the situations that would cause us to take our eyes off the Lord. So open the eyes of our hearts. Father, I just pray that this morning, Lord, you'll touch our hearts, that you'll open the eyes of our hearts to see more of you, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Matthew 7, verses 21. And I do pray that this morning somehow we can really forget about ourselves and and just uh, look to the Lord. Look to the Lord and see what He will reveal to us. See what He will deposit into our spirits. Okay? In order to strengthen us and to equip us. Okay? For our journey. Okay? You know, the Word of God says that we, we have to be a light and the salt of the earth. And, you know, and that's talking about, you know, being, you know, in season with the Lord, you know. And to be the right flavour that we needed to bring. Last night I was at a wedding, and uh, about 400 people there. And um, you know, I sat down at this table, and um, I don't think I ate very much, but I did a lot of talking to the person next to me. And, and all I could do was just share the gospel to him. What I could do was just share the revelation of the word of God. What I could do was just somehow touch him. And I, I'm beyond now trying to you know give people my views or my opinions. Or even share uh, the truth that we know, you know, and and so out of, out of a love, I was reaching out to this man, and uh, he was somewhat resistant at first because everyone has ideas and their own interpretation. Everyone has that, and we have to listen. Forget about trying to debate with anyone, you know, but you just have to accept and respect that we all have views, we all have our opinions, you know. And so it is important that we respect those opinions, but at the same time, out of love, that we, we reach out deeper, extend a little bit more, you know, be sensitive, you know, in the spirit, and, and, and just allow God to minister to us. And this is what would happen. Um, so for about two hours, for two hours I was there, we didn't stay there for the whole night, because I wanted to come home and just... Uh, you know, get into a time of prayer about this morning, and um, it was a good, it was a good, it was a good, um, it was a good night. It's amazing how we are able to see people, you know, when you are walking with the Lord. And I and, and I want to encourage you this morning how great it is for us to walk in the truth of God's word, to walk in the Spirit, you know, to walk in stride, to walk in step. With the Holy Spirit. Never jump ahead. Always be listening, even in your eagerness and your zeal to share the good news. Always be attentive. Always be have an open ear, an open heart, okay, to what the Lord will reveal to us. Amen. And so um, Matthew 7, chapter uh, chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And I pray that we can have ears like Jesus to hear what the Father would say to us. The Father, the God of heaven, 
And the word of God says that we will only know, um, because you know, as we come to that relationship with the Lord, we come to that having that understanding with who God is and um, what His Word means to us, we will soon discover that uh, it's not just about knowing uh, doctrines. We will only know true, the true doctrine if we esteem doing His will, doing His will above just knowing a doctrine, just having a doctrine. Okay, doing His will, and, and this way I think sometimes we can make a mistake, you know, and trying to push our doctrines. You know, are we doing His will? Okay, I mean, look at Jesus. Was Jesus did Jesus represent the, two, the true doctrine? Yes. Okay, look what what He had to endure. Look at how He made His way around that mountain. You know, okay. And say, so if anyone is willing to do his will, he shall know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether we're just speaking our own minds. Jesus says, whether the words that I speak are just my own. You know? And so Jesus was very passionate about that. Uh, did you know a person can desire truth for many different reasons? Come on. A lot of times we can't desire to have a truth, we battle, we fight, we struggle, we debate, we debate, you know, for of, of a truth. And sometimes we do that for different reasons. It can be pride, pride, it can be self-justification, for self-justification purposes. But only a love for truth, only a love for truth, for truth, for truth's sake, for truth's sake. Loving the truth for the truth's sake is what's really pure. Did you get that? Yeah. Have I mixed my words too much? Okay. And so really, you know, loving truth for truth's sake. And I think this is what helps me in my walk, in my struggles. Loving the truth for truth's sake. Not for what I can get out of it. Not for what it means to me. You know, for truth's sake. There is power in truth. This is what enables me to be able to follow Jesus, walk with Jesus, because He says, I am the way. And sometimes we feel lost. <coughs> I look to Jesus and I'm learning. I'm looking to Him for direction, for guidance, for strength. And to me, that's making my way out of my mess. He says, I'm the way, the truth. I accept Him as being truth, truthful. He's, he's true, and He's the life. So accurate and pure doctrines is to love the God of truth more than the truths of God. We can be equipped with so much truth, and yet we can so misappropriate it. I don't know how this is speaking to you, but it's, this is a word that God is speaking to me, and I really, I really felt to share this as a way of just you know, opening our minds to more of God. It is not knowing the book of the Lord that gives life, but knowing the Lord of the book. Mm. Yeah. You know? And I pray that when we open the good book, that it's uh, not just for the purpose of, uh, you know, finding truths that will, you know, justify what it is that we want to get out of it or the purpose for which we want to use it. Okay? And so, knowing, it's not just about knowing the book of the Lord, but knowing the Lord of the book. You've heard other people um, phrase that. That's how true is that? We have a revelation of that. Knowing the book is good, but knowing the author is much better. Mm, yeah. And sometimes we find ourselves engaging in a dialogue, in a discussion, in a debate, in arguments with other people who know what's in the book, you know? But do they really know the author of the book? I want to know the author of the book. John chapter 18, um, uh, verses uh, uh, 38, you know, we, we read where Pilate was uh, faced with Jesus. Because listen, we have the truth. Just imagine having the truth. Just imagine having the truth. What are you going to do with it? How are we using that truth? Because you know, sometimes I feel like I, I, we, 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 can, we, can, we, we just forget about ourselves. We, we take our eyes off the Lord and we can use that truth like a sword. And what are we using? You know, how are we using it? So this is another thing that God's teaching me and taking me into an area of knowing 
You know, um, a, a truth, um, knowledge is power. Did you know that? But guess what? Without yeah. wisdom, you know you have to use that knowledge. You know? So we need to have wisdom. So it's good to have the truth, it's good to have knowledge, but I think God's taken us to, to another level. You know? And, and I find that sometimes in order to step into that, something has to happen on the inside of us that equips us, prepares us, that puts us in the right frame of mind in order to handle and understand what is it about this wisdom that's now telling me things about this knowledge that sometimes we can misappropriate. John chapter 18, verse 38, Pilate um, said um, when he was faced with Jesus' life, you know, when he says, well, what is truth? Because Pilate struggled with the truth that he had. You know, Pilate, he, he, he had discernment. You know, he, he knew that something wasn't right. He knew that this man was being, you know, attacked. He was being judged in the wrong way. He was being accused of, of things that uh, he shouldn't have been accused of. He, he knew, he knew. But he still didn't know how to use that truth. And he kind of says, what is truth? And sometimes we're just like that. We have the truth. But we're surrounded. Our eyes are not on the truth. Our eyes are on the problems. And we're saying, well, what good is having the truth anyway? You understand? What is truth? What is truth in our society? What has truth become in our society? Look, it's not accepted. So who am I to change it? It says, yet only the truth can set us free. Only the truth can set us free. Only the truth is able to open our eyes to the things which are invisible to the natural man. And so we are, in, we are surrounded at times by a people who are so carnally minded. And the Word of God says, you know, that the truth is just meaningless to those who are of a, a natural nature. 1 Corinthians 2, 14, 15. A natural man does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. I believe it's describing a man who desires to walk humbly before the Lord, you know, gently, reverently, not just before the Lord, but even in the midst of a, a people who are going through so many things, you know, we are equipped with the truth. It shouldn't cause us to beat our chests, rather, it should cause us, like Jesus, to embrace and to accept and to be able to see, to step into the, the shoe, you know, uh, uh, into the shoes of, of those who we are needing to reach out. To reach out. I tell you, the truth is empowering. You know, it's empowering, it delivers us, okay, it comforts us, it strengthens us, but it should not make us proud and, you know, and look at ourselves like we're above the law. Yeah. It shouldn't. But let me tell you something, that it's so good to have that truth. Because it changes us on the inside. It really does. To those who are born of the Spirit, the eyes of their hearts can see more clearly than the natural eyes. We speak about having the eyes of our hearts open this morning. The eyes of our hearts, listen, describes our faith. Capture that. Our natural eyes describes our sight, our natural sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. I mean, how can you walk if you're not seeing where you're going? How can you just merely walk by faith? Because faith talks about the eyes of our hearts being wide opened. And we are able to walk in the things of God, even though naturally, carnally, we're not seeing it. Or we, not, we can't understand it. And so faith points us to Jesus, who's walked that path. He's walked that path. And that's the person that we are following. It is Jesus. And so, 
Only through the eyes of our hearts can we see Jesus for who He is. That He is the resurrection and the life. He is the King of, of all rulers and powers and authorities. Wow, that's this Jesus that we know. The difference between seeing Jesus with your natural eyes and seeing Jesus with the eyes of the heart is the difference between Peter and Stephen. Come on, Peter and Stephen. Remember Peter, what do we know Peter for? Peter looked and he saw what? He saw Jesus when he was in the boat. It's so easy to see Jesus when we're in the comfort of our boats in an open sea. You know, it's so easy to declare Jesus, confess Jesus, sing about Jesus when we are in the comfort of our church building surrounded by beautiful friends, our family. It's so easy to talk about faith, isn't it? So he's talking about seeing Jesus. And Peter was a little bit like that. He was in the comfort of his boat. And all of a sudden he looked. He dared to look and see and he saw Jesus. And for a moment there, you know, just like us, we hear a wonderful message and we're able to see and get a glimpse of Jesus. And we rise to our feet and we sing a song. We even jump on our chair, and, you know. And so we sing Jesus. Then we walk out of this building. And all of a sudden we are reminded we're not quite yet in heaven just yet. We're still here on this earth. And we allow our eyes to wander off and to see, you know, the storms of life. We check out the weather, you know, and we're outside the, of, the, of the security and comfort of our air conditioned, you know, building. And all of a sudden we start to get our five senses that, um, you know, I was mentioned earlier today. And we start to realize, hang on a second, so we, and we allow those things to distract us. And that's Peter. Peter was, was moved by sight. He was moved by sight. Physical sight. And uh, we all know what happened. What happened? Because if I ask you, have you seen Jesus? Who's seen Jesus? Who is looking to Jesus? Who is looking to Jesus? And we can all say, well, I'm looking to Jesus. Well, then why are we looking to the problems in this world? Why are we still allowing the problems of this world to distract us? Just in the same way that Peter did. And all his hopes and all his aspirations and all his dreams and all, his, all that courage began to sink. It began to sink. And that was Peter. Now let's look at Stephen. Here was Stephen. And we know Stephen was martyred. Yet he was not distracted by the problems of this world. Oh yes, he may have been distracted many times before this particular incident that took place in his life. But he had allowed his sight of Jesus, his relationship with Jesus. He allowed that relationship with Jesus to really sink in. Every day, friends, we are challenged to allow Jesus to really sink in deeper than just our physical Eyesight. To sink in. And here is, here is Stephen. He, he had experienced Jesus times and times again. And then when he came to the crunch, and let me tell you something, for each one of us, there will be a crunch time. There will be a crunch time. There will be a crunch time. And so here is uh, Stephen. Now Stephen had learned what it means to stand his ground. He wasn't distracted by the problems of this world, namely, namely, and sometimes we've all experienced what it feels to have rocks thrown at us, to have stones thrown at us, to have abuse hurled at us. But here is Stephen, and the Word of God says that uh, as he stood there, stones were being thrown at him. I don't think they were little pebbles either, I think they were big rocks. But here is Stephen, his vision was fixed, I believe, and they were fixed, and they were permanently fixed. Permanently fixed. I'm learning, I'm learning what it means to have my eyes permanently fixed on Jesus. Not just on Sunday mornings. Come on, not just on the good days. Come on, not just when everybody wants to be my friend. I'm learning what it means to have my eye, uh, eyes permanently fixed on Jesus. Last night, my eyes were permanently fixed on Jesus. 
as I, as I poured out my heart to this man. And Stephen did not just know the words of the good book, he knew the author of the good book, my friends, the author of the good book, not just the truths of God, he knew the God of truth. He did not just know the word, but he knew the word that had become flesh and who walked uh, uh, in, in his, uh, who walks in our lives and he, and he makes his dwelling amongst us. That's the Jesus that he knew. That's the Jesus that he knew, friends. And, and he beheld his glory and the glory, uh, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. That's the Jesus that we have come to know. Not Jesus, uh, uh, the word that we can read about, but the word that became flesh. And he's walking amongst us. And he's made his home with us. He's made his home with us. Stephen took a hold of that image, he took a hold of that revelation, and unlike Peter, Stephen continued to look to Jesus. And then all of a sudden, whack, he gets hit with a stone. He gets hit with a rock. Verses uh, 55, if you, if you want to follow, let's follow it. Let's follow it, shall we? Where is it? It's in uh, Acts. It's in Acts. It goes from verses 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, he looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God. Whack! He gets another stone hit at uh, him. And the Word of God says, and he, he looked and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Whack! And another stone hits him. And he says, look, he said, I see heaven open, and the Son of Man is standing at the right hand of God. Whack! And another stone hits him. Mm. And he doesn't allow that to distract him. Mm. He continually keeps his focus permanently fixed, friends. And the Word of God says, as they, and then they, and they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices and they all rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city and they began to stone him. Whack! And meanwhile the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed and whack! Another rock hits him. And he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees and he cried out Lord do not hold this sin against them I thought this was something that only Jesus could have said what can we learn from that reading what can we learn from that situation oh that's okay that was Stephen you know I can't relate to Stephen I can relate to Peter but I don't think God wants us to know him only on that level where we can say I can relate to Peter. I think he wants us to relate to Stephen. It's possible. It's possible. And so he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. And when he had said this, when he had said this, he fell. He fell asleep. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. Here is, here is Stephen. He gave approval, you know, uh, Paul. And Paul was giving approval to his death. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So what do we see here? We see a man... We've demonstrated a great courage. Great courage. But you know what, 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 what else was taking place right there in that incident? Through that situation, God was preparing another man. This is what happens, friends. Don't just look, you know, we're not just to look at ourselves, woe be, look at, you know, no, one's, no one knows what I'm going through. No one must know what I'm feeling, you know. Look at, look at, 
Look at this situation here. We're able to see God was preparing another young man for his service. And that young man was who? Saul. Saul was just a bystander. You know, he agreed to what was happening. And look at how it, how it was that, um, that Jesus, uh, God was able to uh, use Stephen's life for the purpose of preparing. You know what was happening here? There was a battle that's been passed. A battle has been passed. Friends, you know, we have to, to walk this walk with the Lord. And our desire, our need, is that we have to pass the banner. You know, we have um, the martyrs of old to thank for Christianity being alive, still being alive. If it wasn't for their courage, if it wasn't for their faithfulness, Christianity would have died out, don't you think? But Christianity is alive. Why? Because Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive, friends. And so God was preparing another young man for service. And the battle was being passed. A seed had been planted. A seed was being planted into the heart of another man's soul. Eyes of the hearts were being opened up in Saul's life. Hallelujah. And years later, years later, look what Paul writes. When you read it, Let's read it in Ephesians. This is Paul. He has a seed planted, a seed of righteousness. And this is what it is that we are doing, friends. You and I, when we are looking to the Lord, choosing to look to Jesus and not to the problems and the persecutions, okay? And we are able to withstand and allow that transformation, that change to take place in each and every one of us. It's called resurrection power. Which causes the eyes of our hearts to be opened to the truths of God, to the God of truth. And the Word of God says here in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, we read from verses 8 I pray also that the eyes of your hearts may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which He has called you. This is Saul, this is the one who had given the okay to kill Stephen. The Word of God says that you may know the hope to which He has called you, the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and His incomparably great power for us to believe that power is like the working of His mighty strength. Come on. Which He exerted in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at the right hand of the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. And every color can be given not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under His feet and appointed Him to be head over everything for the church, which is His body and the fullness of Him who fills everything in every way. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Wow, isn't that powerful? Isn't that powerful? That's awesome. That is awesome. And, um, you know, and Paul did uh, a, a tremendous work. A tremendous work. You are going to do a tremendous work. Hallelujah. You know, I am. Uh, Hebrews 10 35. That's a scripture that I was looking forward to finish uh, this morning's talk. Hebrews. At uh, ten thirty five. Hebrews ten thirty five. Come on, let's read it. The word of God says, Do not throw away your confidence. Do not throw away your confidence. Hallelujah. Don't throw away your confidence. Come on, who is able to give us the confidence that we need? Who's able to give us the courage that we need? Jesus. Come on, who is it? Jesus. Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? Come on. Jesus is firmly fixed in our sights. Permanently, our, our vision, our sight is permanently fixed on Him. Hallelujah. Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, 
you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are being saved. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. As we come around the communion this morning, I pray that we are able to take a hold of his emblems and, uh, you know, and help us uh, uh, to see that uh, our minds are made up. That our eyes are fixed on the author of a good book that speaks to us. Hallelujah. And so this morning as we come around these emblems, uh, you know, don't just put your trust in, uh, you know, in these uh, emblems uh, on, on their own, uh, but, the, but they represent a life that's alive, that's working on the inside of, uh, of, the, of each one of us here this morning. So can I just have two volunteers very quickly come forward? Just come and take these emblems and let's just uh, distribute them to each one of us. Um, and as we take a hold of these emblems, my friends, as we partake of the Lord's table, my friends, uh, it is uh, our way of saying, yes, Lord Jesus, I thank you for the miracle work of power that is alive on the inside of me, that causes my, the eyes of my heart uh, uh, to be open uh, to what you are showing me, not what the, what the world is throwing at me. And Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, that we have the privilege uh, this morning, Lord Jesus, as we gather, as we come, as we partake uh, of the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we look to you, Lord Jesus, uh, you are you are the uh, uh, the glorious one who, who shines and beams His light into our hearts uh, on a daily basis, and we give you all praise and, and all glory this morning in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, Hallelujah! Can we all stand to our feet? Can we all begin to just give thanks to the one and only our Lord Jesus Christ this morning? Can we all spontaneously enter into a time of thanksgiving?